Hello everyone. So we're going to continue on with the equity method. Actually, this is our last presentation. We have learning objectives uh, six and seven. Uh, for learning objective six, we're talking about the intra-entity transactions. Uh, if you recall, we mentioned these as part of the significant influence criteria. So um, transactions between um, investor and investee. Uh, in this case, we are talking about sell and purchase of inventory. So the first thing that we need to do, and this may not have any bearing at this point uh, for chapter one, but it will be for chapters two through six, is to understand how this relationship is between the investor and investee. Uh, so the sales of inventory can take place from the investor to the investee, or from the investee to the investor. So we need to have that clear uh, before we proceed with the transactions. So in terms of um, how are we or, or why are we doing with uh, the intra-entity inventory transactions is basically we're going to delay uh, profit recognition um, until the buyer sells the goods to someone who is unrelated or not part of this intra-entity uh, inventory sale. And so the reason for that is because we don't want either the investor or the investee to manipulate uh, sales in order to inflate uh, balance sheet or income statement, um, etc. So we want to make sure that these transactions are actually taking place at arm's length. And so we're going to defer the gross profit until um, the sale of the goods is um, sold to someone, uh, a third party, an unrelated party. And so we're going to have to calculate a deferred gross profit um, and like we said, we're deferring this gross profit until the sales take place to someone outside this relationship. And so I have a little formula here for the deferred gross profit. We're going to take our year-end inventory, uh, whatever is left in inventory at the end of the year. And we're talking about uh, sales price, no cost. And then we're going to multiply that by the gross profit percentage and then multiply it by um, the ownership percentage. So the, the order doesn't really matter as long as we have the three components. And so for some of you who may be you know, asking, what, how do we calculate gross profit percentage? I have that formula here. So going back to maybe our uh, principles of financial accounting, uh, we take our sales, uh, subtract our cost of goods sold, and that would equal a gross profit. And then if we take that figure and divide it uh, by sales, uh, then we come up with a gross profit percentage of sales. And so we have an example here. Uh, we have an intra-entity sale. Um, and we have already given the gross profit percentage, so we don't have to calculate that. We have that the ending inventory is 10,000. Um, and so 30% of the 10,000 is 3,000. So that's the profit associated with um, this sale. And we have a 40% interest in this um, investee. And so the amount of gross profit will be the 1,200. So we have that worked out in this little formula that we had in the previous slide. So this means that in year one, we're going to have to defer. Uh, in this case, and, and just in general, when you're working out with these problems uh, with this textbook, the general assumption is that the inventory will be sold the next, the following year. So the, the sale took place in 2018. So the year that we actually had that sale, the intra-entity sale, that's when we are going to defer the gross profit. So that's 2018. In order to defer that, we're gonna have to reduce our uh, share of income that we're reporting on the income statement. 
and then we're going to have to also decrease our investment by the same amount. So it's like a reverse entry of uh, the recognition of our share of net income. Uh, so we're reducing, again, uh, by that portion of the profit that we need to defer. And then on the second year, we're assuming that this inventory was finally sold to an unrelated party. So we're going to recognize the gross profit. And to do so, we um, debit our, so we are increasing our investment in minor company in this case. And then we're increasing our equity and in investee income, so our income statement in our balance sheet, respectively. Um, you can read through this pretty much what we said before between the upstream and downstream. Um, another example, we have an investee that sells merchandise costing $40,000 uh, to uh, the investor. Uh, so this is upstream. And I should note, uh, at this point, it doesn't really make a difference. You can go back to the previous slide and see that the entry was pretty much the same. The calculation was the same. Uh, but this, again, will make a difference when we're talking about consolidation. So it's good to have um, an initial understanding of what these transactions mean. And so in this case, we don't have a gross profit percentage. So we are to calculate that. We're told that the merchandise uh, cost 40,000, but it was sold for 60,000. Uh, so there's a gross profit of 20,000. Uh, they still have 15,000 remaining uh, in inventory. And then we have a net income of 120,000. Okay, uh, so we're gonna report our 40%, our share of this net income. Uh, so we're going to debit investment in minor and credit the equity and investee income for 48000 And then uh, we're going to have to calculate the amount of the deferral. Uh, we take our ending inventory times uh, the ownership percentage. And then uh, we have our little calculation for the gross profit percentage. In this case, it comes out to be about 33%. And so the amount of the deferred gain is $2,000. And again, we're decreasing uh, the equity in investee income and decreasing the investment in minor company by the amount of the deferred uh, gross profit. So when we're looking at these T accounts, uh, we keep adding, adding items as we go along, but this is um, our last uh, presentation. So pretty much this is the T account with the complete um, items for both accounts and the effect on the uh, financial statements. So we have the investment in investee account that's reported on the balance sheet under assets. This account is increased by our share of the investee income decreased by our share of the investee loss, decreased by our share of the investee's dividends, decreased by the amortization. Note that I'm not, I'm not saying our share because uh, when we calculated amortization, we have already taken our share into consideration. So we don't need to take that percentage again. Okay, and then we have the deferred gain, um, the deferred uh, gross profit in year one will reduce this account, but in year two will increase it. So it's practically a wash uh, for the asset account. Uh, just have to watch out what years you are reporting because that might make a difference. Again, we're not taking or saying our share or a percentage because we already took that into consideration when we calculated the deferred gross profit. The same thing with the equity and investee uh, income. I'm just gonna go down here to the deferred gross profit. Year one is gonna decrease this account. Year two is gonna increase it. Now be careful with the equity and investee income account because this is an income statement account. So our income statement accounts are closed at the end of the period. So we need to remember that, that this account uh, will be reset back to zero 
uh, for the next period. So keep that in mind as you are working through the problems. Uh, so just, uh, you know, certain things that management needs to take into account when making decisions about um, equity method and uh, investing, you know, uh, a great percentage or having this significant influence over other uh, the investee. And so basically we need to look at, you know, our ability uh, to raise capital. We need to look at uh, managerial compensation. Uh, that might be an incentive uh, or not. Uh, we need to look at loans. What kind of loans do we have? How is this addition of an investment going to affect our ratios? Okay. Uh, and then, of course, our manager's reputation. Are they able to manage properly um, the capital, the company's capital? Uh, criticisms of the equity method um, are basically just based on what we talked about, these percentages that are sort of subjective. Uh, and so we really need to make, an, you know, really analyze the level of significant influence that may turn into a control. Okay, so where is that kind of, you know, blurring the lines between when does a significant influence turn into control? So that's something that we need to be very analytical about. And the other aspect is that the equity method may allow for off-balance sheet financing. Um, so loans uh, may not be reflected on the balance sheet properly. They may be kept out of the balance sheet. Uh, because of the equity method. So that's something. And so in that respect, this may also affect our uh, ratios. It may not actually reflect the proper performance uh, in terms of um, loans and assets. Okay, the last point uh, for this chapter has to do with our ability to elect to use the fair value uh, to account for these investments. So we don't actually have to use the equity method. Um, we, we may want to because um, you know, it's easier than uh, keeping track of the fair value. We may not have a fair value that we're able to determine, uh, but we do have this option of electing uh, to report under the fair value, the assets and liabilities. And so in that case, if we were to use the fair value option, then any changes in fair value will be included in our earnings. Uh, fair value um, may uh, reflect the proper uh, assets, the proper measurement for assets and liabilities uh, than the equity method or the cost method and so that's something to keep in mind. And this pretty much concludes our presentation for chapter one.